right, so welcome again uh, to our Friday night. You can give your offering. Uh, feel free to give your offering. Um, you can transfer your offering too if you want to, all right? Praise God, feel free. All right, uh, so I will continue. Uh, we still have a little bit uh, to cover uh, here. Um, I was a little bit occupied, so I did not uh, add the notes here, but I will, I will do that to finish this topic, and then we continue with other uh, topics. I think we still have about four or five uh, topics on the doctrine, uh, the foundation of Christian doctrine. So the doctrine of the atonement, I think by now you begin to understand how important this subject is, the doctrine of the atonement. And last week, we talk about the <coughs> uh, the work of the atonement uh, historically and doctrinally, and tonight we cover. Uh, actually, last week we talk about the doctrine of the atonement historically, uh, about the atoning death of Christ, and we cover the false theories, false theories of Christ's death. All right, accidental theory, martyr theory, uh, moral influence theory, governmental theory, uh, commercial theory, and also the eradication theory. Um, if you cannot remember, you can go back to the video in our YouTube and go back there and listen again so you can have a better grasp and understand regarding this uh, false theory of the atoning death of Christ. And then we talk about the scriptural views concerning Christ's death. Paul says, uh, Paul says, according to the scripture, 1 Corinthians 15, right? According to the scripture. So that is very important. You talk about Christ's death, resurrection, all this must be according to scriptures that Christ died historically it's a fact uh, and also he died for our sins that is doctrinally yeah is the doctrinal interpretation of the atonement so the historical fact and also the doctrinal uh, interpretation is very important in this okay so now tonight, we will look at the scriptural facts on the unique death of Christ. Jesus' death is very unique because it is different from other deaths. All right? It has a purpose. The death of Jesus has a purpose. All right? So let's, let's go through this one by one. Number one, the death of Christ was part of God's eternal purpose. Revelation 13, 8, uh, 1 Peter 1, verse 18 to 20, Acts chapter 2, verse um, 22, 23. Maybe we read the Revelation. So we will read, we cannot read everything, all these scriptures because of time. But um, let us read some of them. Maybe Revelation 13, verse 8. Uh, Revelation 13, verse 8. It says here, and, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written uh, in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So it is from the foundation of the world. All right? So it has an eternal purpose because the death of Christ uh, is already is from the foundation of the world. Of the world. Let's read another one. First Peter 1. First Peter 1. 18 to 20. <clears throat> Praise God. Thank God for technology. We have digital Bibles. So it's more quicker to turn there. But I encourage you to read your Bible. With your Bible book. Alright. Bible book. Use that as your Bible in your house. Of course you bring that in the church too. Right? But sometimes, like myself, I find like teaching, travel around, 
teaching and also uh, I find it more better to use digital because very fast to turn there, right? But personally, in the house, I read a Bible book. I use Bible book, all right? The hard copy. 18, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation or lifestyle received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. So, it has an eternal purpose, right? From the foundation of the world, before the foundation, was foreordained. It was foreordained. So, Jesus, that is unique because it was foreordained from the foundation of the world, before the foundation of the world. Number two, the death of Christ was foretold under the law, the Psalms and the prophets. So when you look at the law, you know, the Pentateuch, the five, uh, the first five books of the Bible, the law of Moses and all of that, the book of Psalms, the prophets, even Jesus himself quoted this. All right, in Luke 24, verse 27, verse 44, 45, Jesus said about him, it is written in the prophets, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. Matthew 5, 17 to 18, all right, it is fulfilled. He came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. So the death of Christ is unique because it was foretold. I mean, how many... Uh, People out there who, whose death, all right, that we know was foretold. <laughs> nobody, can, It's nobody, all right, was foretold for, for many centuries. And this one is not only for many centuries, but from the foundation of the world or before the foundation of the world, all right? So it was foretold under the law, the Psalms, and the prophets. Number three, the death of Christ was the chief purpose of the incarnation. He must die. He was born to be crucified. The incarnation was not an end in itself, but the means to an end. So, <clears throat> Mark, let's read Mark 10.45. Mark 10.45. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So, he gave his life for the Ransom for many. Okay? So there is uh, a purpose, all right? Actually, it's the chief purpose of the incarnation. Number four, the death of Christ is the major theme of the gospel of grace. The death of Christ. <coughs> the gospel of grace. You now, we're not talking about the, the gospel of grace that people are talking about. Today, you know, uh, the grace and all of that, because there is uh, sometimes quite extreme. Uh, they talk about the gospel of grace, all right? Even they greet you also. They said, oh, grace, may the grace of God be upon you. And uh, uh, some people, because they just listen to that kind of teaching and preaching, so their mind is into it without understanding the whole thing about grace, right? Uh, we believe in the gospel of grace, but not to the extreme until uh, people believe in the, you know, they call it the pseudo grace, false grace and all, all right? Um, so the gospel of grace, Christ died for our sins, the death penalty was paid, and this is God's good news to a sinner, all right? First Corinthians 15, we read that, Paul says, according to the scripture, his death, his resurrection, his suffering, is according to the scripture. Let's go to Romans 5, verse 5 to 10. 
Romans 5, 5 to 10. <clears throat> he said, And hope makes not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet for adventure, for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commanded or God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Now very important to observe that word wrath. Wrath is referring to the end of day, the judgment of God, the wrath of God. So we are uh, delivered, we are saved, means delivered, escaped from the judgment, the wrath of God, all right, the judgment of God. Um, for, verse 10, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved. By his life, right? Very, very powerful. Number five, the death of Christ is prominent in the New Testament writing. So, uh, the death of Christ is like a major theme. Is a major theme, the major subject. Um, we cannot live a Christian life without this truth about the death of Jesus Christ. Right, so there's a lot of scriptures there. Um, the last three days of Jesus' earthly life occupy about one fifth of the contents of the four gospels. Yeah, his death is mentioned about 175 times in the New Testament, one out of 53 verses. Uh, Peter, John, and Paul are major interpreters of Christ that they emphasize when they preach the gospel, when they go everywhere preaching the gospel, planting churches, winning souls for Jesus, they always preach about the death of Jesus Christ. Right? So the fact that we are here today, we are alive, we have eternal life, we have a new life in Christ and all, is because of the death of Jesus Christ. Jesus must die for the world. He must die. Because if he don't die, the new covenant will not be sealed. Right? The gospel of grace cannot be preached without the death of Jesus Christ. Victory will not be ours, or complete total victory will not be ours if Jesus did not die. He must die. You know, this is the mystery sometimes people ask questions. If he is God, why he need to die? He can save people just like that, or can change human race just like that because, because he is God. You know, if you understand the teaching of this uh, doctrine of atonement, the atoning death of Christ, then you will begin to understand why Jesus need to die. Why he had, he need to die. Right? Why he need to die. The first Adam disobeyed and because of his disobedience the whole human race are in sin and death passed upon all men. But because of the second Adam in his obedience to God's will, we receive life. Through him. It is very, very powerful. Right? And Satan cannot stand that. Satan cannot stand a Christian who knows this truth. Satan cannot defeat and cannot, uh, cannot go against a Christian who knows this truth. Right? Because the death of Jesus broke his power. The death of Jesus on the cross defeated him and took back the keys to the kingdom. So Satan cannot stand this. Hallelujah. Hey, Number six, the death of Christ 
is the burden of the law and the prophets. Oh, I you not going on. Moses and Elijah. You don't Moses know. Moses is the law. Elijah represents the prophets. On Mount of Transfiguration, spoke to Jesus of his disease or departure or exodus or exit. All right. In the month of transfiguration, Moses and Elijah came to talk to Jesus about his exit from this earth and how he will exit, how he will depart from this earth. And um, if you understand, the Bible teaches about the kinsman redeemer of a lost race. He is the kinsman redeemer uh, that have the right to redeem. Uh, his brother, you know, to buy him, to redeem him. So he pay, he need to pay the ransom, he need to pay the price to redeem. And that is us, the lost race, lost because of sin, because of uh, the disobedience of Adam. <clears throat> Can you press for me, please? It's not moving. Right. That's number five, six, seven. The death of Christ is essential to Christianity. The death of Christ is essential to Christianity. That's why Good Friday, remembering the crucifixion of Jesus, the passion of Christ, is very important. Every year we celebrate that to remind us how important it is uh, the death of Jesus Christ to us as believers. All religions are built upon the teachings of their founder who are dead or subject to death. Christianity alone is built upon the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, its founder. The resurrection attests to Jesus' divine priesthood. The resurrection. Without the death of Christ, Christianity is reduced to the level of other religion. So that is what makes us different because of the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. He's alive. He's not dead. He died and because there is a purpose why he need to die. To be our atonement. To atone us. To redeem us. To pay the price. He must die. To seal the new covenant. He must die. But he rose again. So that makes us different. We serve a living God. We serve Jesus the Lord who is alive. Number eight. The death of Christ is essential to our salvation. It's important. That's why he need to die. Because it is important for our salvation. We cannot be saved without the death of Jesus Christ. He must die so that we will live. All right? He gave up his life so that we can take our life through him. All right? It's important. A lot of scriptures there. You can go to the video later on if you want those scriptures. But let me read here. Christ must die for sin to be dealt with. That is the only way for sin to be dealt with. All right? For God to pardon sin and remain consistent with his holiness, Christ must pay sin's penalty. All right? So, the balance is there. Uh, God forgive the sin, yet remain consistent with his holiness. Because he is holy, sin must be judged. You know, he didn't say, oh, okay, you repent and uh, say sorry. Okay, yeah, I forgive you, you are free. No. But God said, okay, you repent, you're sorry. But somebody must die for you, for your sin. Because the, 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 penalty, the penalty of sin is death. So because you sin... You must die. But because I love you, God said, I love you. I want you. So I send my son to die on your behalf. You do not have to die. But 
there will be a sacrifice. And this pattern has been from the beginning. When Adam fell because God told them, Genesis 2, he said, the day that you eat this fruit, you will die. So Adam and Eve took the fruit, they ate it, the particular fruit, so they go against God's commandment, they should die because God said, the day that you eat it, you will die. But then what happened? Adam and Eve did not die. But God killed an animal. The animal died on their behalf. Genesis 3.21. God killed an animal and took his skin, shed the blood, slaughtered it, shed the blood, kill it. It died on their behalf. And God took his skin and clothed them. So the pattern is there. So in the Old Testament, we can see the pattern of this. That's why we can understand that in the New Testament, Jesus must die because his death is essential to our salvation. We should be thankful and be grateful. Say, thank you, Jesus, for you die for me. I should die. All right? We should be the one who died because of our sin. But Jesus took our place. And he was, Isaiah said, he was smitten, afflicted. He was smitten by God. Afflicted. All right? He bore our sins and carried our sorrows. All right? So he died for us. The wages of sin is death. Wow. So we can have hope and confidence today to live like that. We're so grateful and thankful for Jesus. Without Jesus, we are nothing. We are nothing. We are doomed for destruction. We are doomed for judgment. But because of Jesus, we have hope. Number nine, the death of Christ was a voluntary act. It's a voluntary act. John 10, 17. Let's read that. John 10, 17. Sometimes I don't remember that. So we had to read it. John 10, 17. Therefore does my father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. Nobody killed Jesus. He laid down his life. Uh, the Bible says when Jesus was hanging on the cross, he said he gave up the ghost. He gave up his spirit. Nobody took it from him. When the soldiers pierced Jesus, he's already dead. The spear did not kill Jesus. He's already dead. Right? Nobody killed him. But of course, because of our sin and all of that, that brought him to the cross. Our sins, transgression and all caused him to be nailed to the cross. He suffered. You know, carry our cross he suffered the, uh, what they call the, the beating, you know, he was whipped and all. He was crowned with crown of thorns. He was nailed to the cross. He was bleeding and all. It's all because of our sins. All because of our sins. But nobody killed him. He laid down his life. He said, I laid down my life so that I might take it again. Let's go to Matthew. It's good to read this again. Matthew. Uh, 26, 53 to 54. Matthew 26. He said, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels? 12 legions, yeah? One legion is 6,000, so 6 times 12, 6,000 times 12. But how, but how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that, uh, that it must be? So the scripture must be fulfilled. Isaiah 53, 12. 
Maybe we read that also. Isaiah 53:12. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because because he has poured out his soul unto death. He has poured out his soul unto death. So means he, he gave up his life. And he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sin of many. And made intercession for the transgression. So it was a voluntary act. Why? Because God saw you and I. We are heading towards destruction. You know, we need a savior to save us. He sent Jesus to die for us. You know, and, and Isaiah heard that when Isaiah saw the glory of God in Isaiah 6. And God said, whom shall I send? Who shall go for us? Actually, that voice, not speaking to Isaiah. I, I don't know how many of you catch that. I mentioned this many times. That voice was not spoken, uh, speaking to Isaiah to send Isaiah. Even though Isaiah said, here am I. Here I am. Here am I. Send me. Isaiah heard that words, heard that voice. And he was convicted that God was sending him. So like commissioning him. But that, that voice was not speaking to Isaiah. That voice was speaking to the God the Son. God was having a meeting. Isaiah saw the throne room of God and he saw God and his glory. God was looking at mankind that they need a redeemer, that they need a savior. So God was having a meeting, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And God was talking to the three of them. He said, whom shall I send and who shall go for us? Isaiah overheard that voice and he replied, Jeremiah sent me. But if you read the book of Psalms in the book of Hebrews chapter 10, Jesus said, in the volume of the book, it was written of me. All right. So he, he said, I come to do your will, O God. So the son replied, Jeremiah sent me. So that's why the father sent the son. Voluntarily he accepted the commission to be the sacrifice for mankind. I think very, very um, interesting and powerful uh, insights to understand that. Uh, Jesus voluntarily um, accept the Father's will and commission. The cross was Jesus' deliberate choice, not his fate. He offered himself as a free will or voluntary op offering as shadowed for in the voluntary burnt meal, peace offerings in Leviticus. Same thing like Isaac. God told Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. That is a picture of Christ. When Abraham took Isaac, went to the Mount Moriah um, until they arrived in that place. So Isaac said, where's the sacrifice, my father? And Abraham said, God will provide himself a sacrifice. And God, uh, Abraham took Isaac, bound him, put him on the altar, and wants to slay him. But very interestingly, if you read the story, Isaac never refused and never struggled. He just obeyed his father. That's a picture of Jesus, Isaac. So he voluntarily uh, gave himself. So his seeming tragedy was God's triumph. It becomes God's triumph. And the devil don't understand that. Satan did not know. He thought like he put Jesus on the cross. He thought like he was having his victory, but he didn't know the wisdom of God that through the cross, his power and dominion will be broken. Oh, powerful. I like that picture when Jesus was hanging on the cross from 12 to 3 p.m., the Bible says the whole place was darkened. Was darkened. You read that? So I take that picture as if that Satan and all his hosts, all his demons gathering together to witness the death 
of the Son of God to witness and saying that this is it. We are winning. <laughs> so they come and gather on that Golgotha to witness the death of the Son of God. But little did they know that through that death of Jesus Christ, their dominion and their power will be broken. Can you imagine the place who are filled with darkness for three hours from 12 to 3 p.m.? And I want to imagine like when Jesus, the Bible says he gave up the ghost. He said, it is finished. And he gave up the ghost. He died. And can you just imagine the clouds straight away, it turned to bright again. That is powerful. That is powerful. Even the graves of old saints, you know, was open and they came up alive walking through the city. Very, very powerful. So the death of Christ was a, an atoning sacrifice. The atoning death of Christ, that is a redemption, a ransom, substitution, reconciliation, propitiation, and atonement. Wow. All of this. Still a lot, you know. I think about how many? Yeah. Okay, we can go on. We have 20. 20 actually. So now we are 11. Huh? 11. The death of Christ was a necessary a penalty for sin. Sin has been dealt with. Only in Christ you are freed from sin. If you believe and you receive Christ in your life, you know, he's atoning that and all freed you from sin. Isaiah 53, Micah 5, 1 to 3. Jesus suffered at the hands of a righteous and holy God. The death penalty which Christ suffered satisfies the justice and law of God. How? It is satisfied the justice of God. Uh, the state criminal have to be penalized for their crimes. God's divine justice satisfied as penalty executed. So in the death of Jesus Christ, God's penalty was executed. So it satisfied his justice and his wrath. B, it satisfies the outrage holiness of God. God is holy, therefore sin must be judged. Because he's holy, sin must be judged. No, no favoritism. David, he was judged because he committed sin. Uzzah, when David carried the ark to his place, uh, he put forth his hand, tried to help the uh, ark not to topple. God judged him. The sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, they offered strange fire. God killed them. All right? Moses. Great prophet of God. God spoke to him face to face. But God judged him. God said you cannot enter into the promised land because it, you disobeyed me. And God pleaded with God. He pleaded with God. But God said no, no, no. It's God's holiness. It's serious, yeah? It's very serious. All right? Adam and Eve, first man. God can say, oh, it's okay. You are my first creation. You are my first human being. You are special. You know, I created you. Uh, specially created, you know. You are not born, but I create you. And breathe life in you. So, it's okay. You, you disobey me. It's okay because you are my. No, God judged them. God drive them out from the Garden of Eden. So it's God's holiness. So it's satisfied. The death of Jesus satisfied the outraged holiness of God. See, it is satisfied the violated law of God. The law of God was violated, but the death of Jesus Christ satisfies God's uh, justice. So thus his death was necessary. It vindicated God's holiness because God is holy. Upheld his justice and satisfied the demands of his broken law. Now, who on earth or among humankind can fulfill all of these things? That's why Isaiah said, our righteousness 
is as filthy rags. There's no amount of good works and good deeds that can pay for your sin and can pay for your way to heaven. Nobody, nobody, only Jesus fulfilled all of these things and is satisfied, vindicated God's holiness, upheld his justice and satisfied the demands of his broken law. Nobody can do this. Nobody can fulfill these demands of God, only Jesus, through his death. Through his death. So, we are what? We are nothing. We are nothing. If you think about it, like, there's nothing to be proud in this world. Why, why you need to be proud? Some people think very big, think very high. What for? We are nothing. We are all the same in the eyes of God. And we all need a savior. We all need Jesus to die for our sins. Because we all will face God in the judgment seat of God. We all will stand before God and give account to him. We all will do that. Yeah. So when you think about this, there's nothing. So sometimes quite a fearful thing to think about that also. That's why we need to live consistently, holy, godly before the Lord. Amen. We cannot say, oh, I have a church, God. Oh, my church is very big, God. Oh, Lord, I have so many churches planted, God. You know, I'm qualified for heaven. No, your ministry will not pay for you. Your ministry will not qualify you to be in heaven. It's only Jesus because he died for you. Amen. Some people get involved with this ministry, got involved with ministry, got involved with this ministry. Wow, they feel like, wow, I'm somebody, wow, you know. No, we are nothing. We are servants of God. Jesus gave a parable about a servant and a master. He said, how many of you will have a servant who works in your field and then he come home? When your servant come home, you said, hey, come, come, servant. Sit down. Yeah, wash your feet and then eat the food. Jesus said, will you do that? As a master, he said, no. But what you will do? Your servant comes from field, after work come field, he's tired. Won't you not say to him, hey, you arrive already. Yeah. Go and prepare food for me, cook for me, because he is your servant. You can order him. And then when all of these things happen, Jesus said, you all are servants. And you serve one master. And at the end of the day, when you stand before God, you will say what? We are unprofitable servants. We just do what is our duty. We are all unprofitable servants. We are doing what God asks us to do. Everybody is the same. Amen? Yeah. So there's nothing to be so proud because we are all the same. Yeah. Okay, I will touch this one and then we will continue the rest next week. Um, 94, yeah, Sikaina. Uh, the death of Christ was a manifestation of divine love. So when you talk about the cross, when you talk about the death of Jesus, his passion, his suffering, all of those that Jesus went through to go to the cross. Is God saying to you, I love you. His divine love. He loved you before you love him. He loved you while you are wallowing in your sins. He loved you while you were rejecting him, refusing him, not knowing him, not believing in him. He loves you. John 3.16 says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. First John 3.16 says the same thing. If you love your brother, you will lay down your life. And that is what Jesus did. Interesting. John, gospel and the letter of John. The same writer. Romans 5.8. God demonstrated his love to us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Holiness hates sin. 
And not only hate sin, but he deals with sin. God could not manifest love at the expense of holiness, not save the sinner without judging sin. So balance there, the love of God and the holiness of God. Christ's death is a manifestation of both holiness and love of God. So his death demonstrates divine love. So his death manifests God's holiness. Why? Because God is holy. Sin must be judged by death. Right? And the love of God, because God loves you, then he sent his son to die for you. So it's a manifestation. It's a demonstration of the love of God. You know, sometimes we need a revelation of this uh, truth to appreciate God's love for you. God loves you by not saying to you, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. But God say, I love you to you by dying for you. You know, and that speaks more than words itself. He died for you because he loves you. So the cross is speaking of divine, God's divine love, all right? So I, I will end here. Um, I believe that really helps us and bless us. Even though we take time, um, sometimes I feel like I don't have to stretch so much, but uh, I don't want us to miss many things. So we go slowly, even though we spend a lot of weeks in this. You know, some t Bible teachers, like they take the book of the, the Bible, uh, for example, the book of Jude. The book of Jude is only one chapter. <laughs> but they teach it for the whole year. So every week you hear about Jude and Jude and Jude from January to December, <laughs> all right? But it's good to be like this so that we can uh, pick up a lot of things and we can remember a lot of things, all right? So praise God. You are blessed because you are here every week. Amen. All right, so maybe we can encourage the rest to come and just be here. Just be here and listen. Just listen and uh, learn and apply this in our life. It's you know, Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. It will set you free. By reading, listening, and hearing the word, you know the truth, you receive the truth, it will set you free. And that is what we are doing here. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you for your word. We thank you for the atoning death of Jesus Christ. Jesus died on the cross for us. You demonstrate your divine love for us and to us. Lord, by revealing and manifesting and saying how much you love us, by sending Jesus to die for us on the cross. We want to thank you for Jesus for Dying for us voluntarily. He gave up his life. He laid down his life so that he may take it again. Jesus gave up the ghost for us. Jesus responded to the Father, Here am I, sent me. Lord, in the volume of the book, it is written of me, Jesus said, Behold, I come to do your will, O God. And the Hebrew says, By the which will we are sanctified. We are justified, we are delivered, we are saved, Lord, by the will of God that Jesus responded to. Lord Jesus, thank you for your love for us. Lord Jesus, thank you for taking the cross for us. Thank you, Jesus, for your death. Thank you, Lord, for all your sufferings. And because of that, your word says we are saved from the wrath to come. We are saved from the judgment on the last days. We escape the wrath of God. When God will come to judge the world, we are delivered. We have been escaped from the judgment of God. Thank you, Lord. We do not have to go through the judgment of the wrath of God because of Jesus. He died for us. Jesus was judged for us. Jesus satisfied the wrath of God for us. We thank you, Lord. 
We thank you for this truth. We thank you for your love. And Lord, we pray that you help us to live for you, to be committed in living for Jesus, to be faithful, to be faithful, living for Jesus, because for all that he has done for us, Oh, the precious life that Jesus has given us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Wonderful Jesus. We thank you. For the new covenant has been sealed. The Holy Spirit has been poured out because Jesus died for us and rose again. We thank you. We love you, Jesus. Father, we thank you and we love you. Uh, we thank you, blessed Holy Spirit. We thank you and we love you. Oh, we praise your name. Thank you, thank you, and thank you. Hallelujah. You bless us, Lord, and as we come back this Sunday to celebrate Pentecost, we pray for special visitation and special outpouring of the Holy Spirit this Sunday in the name of Jesus. Thank you so much. Bless your people as they come. We love you. We praise you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right. We will not go into prayer. I won't keep you long. You go home and rest. Amen. God knows all our prayer needs. Amen. Praise God. God bless you. God bless you.